Hello, my name's Amy Sharrox and I'm a British artist. I, for seven years, I have um, gathered a collection of water uh, in different parts of the world uh, to ask people to build with me uh, a museum of water, which asks the question, if you could keep one water, what would it be? And so the museum, such as it exists in different places around the world, um, uh, treasures the water that people have given me, any water in any bottle. Uh, it's really lovely uh, to be here in conversation with you, Mark. This is Mark Calzavara from uh, Council of Canadians. Um, and it's, uh, it, I asked you to come for this conversation today um, to, uh, we met last year when I visited Toronto and I, uh, I wanted to talk with you again just as we begin to think of what a Museum of Water for Toronto might look like. Um, I wondered if we could begin a conversation again around the context of water uh, in Toronto uh, and Canada. Uh, what are the questions that uh, we need to be looking at what are the uh, what are the issues for water where you are? Um, I am really in this to learn, so it's lovely to have this chance to talk with you. Thanks for having me. It's a really a pleasure to be here and to be uh, talking about the Museum of Water as well. It's an incredible project, and we're really looking forward to seeing it fulfilled here in in Canada. Well, the Council of Canadians is a, a social justice group. We've been around for thirty five years. Um, Water is one of the main campaigns we work on, uh, along with international trade issues, healthcare, uh, climate and energy issues, and uh, democracy. And essentially, as an organization, we're trying to, to prevent the, our, our governments from giving everything away to the corporations, including the control of our water. And so uh, fighting for, the, for water as a public good and as a commons is very important to the, to the work we do. We've been doing that, uh, uh, wa the water work especially for over 20 years now. That's so lovely, this idea of the commons uh, and of water as a human right, not a human need, as some uh, organizations have tried to uh, get it downplayed to. Um, uh, and it's also it's interesting how you talk about uh try not to give everything away and also the sense of that i have of trying to keep water for the people you know this sort of so how to resist the privatization of water everywhere um is also a huge part of my job <laughs> it feels this activism yeah and and we're you know it's a non-stop pressure the the corporate assault on our common water, um, whether it's uh, corporations like Nestle who want to own the water and bottle it and sell it back to us at exorbitant fees, or whether it's uh, pipeline or oil uh, corporations that, um, that want to use our common water areas, our watersheds to, uh, to dump their refuse in or to, to just put them at risk by shipping, you know, incredibly toxic products through uh, in, uh, in ways that are just not particularly safe, not safe enough, that's for sure. Um, and we've seen so many examples of oil spills and, um, and, and other toxic uh, uh, emissions from industry destroying watersheds. And, you know, the people suffer and the corporations uh, move on. But actually how to change that discourse and challenge with this, with these ideas, with this, uh, with this knowledge of public commons and shared care and, uh, you know, they're coming for all of us. We all need to, to stand up for all of us and change the discourse and the language. Um, Absolutely, yeah. And, and having people connected to their watersheds um, is absolutely critical for the, the long-term protection of all water everywhere. I mean, the water is all connected. If you've ever seen a map of, of watersheds for uh, any particular area, it's like, um, it's like the veins of the body, you know, the, the blood supply of the body. It's an amazing interconnection. And uh, if people are connected to their own personal watershed, like I live in the Humber River watershed here in Toronto, and um, 
and it is you know it's critical to uh, to the uh, health of the Great Lakes and you know the well I think there's 40 million people roughly around the Great Lakes that are all relying on the on the Great Lakes to be uh, clean enough to drink and to provide the other um, the other benefits to our society speaking you know just for our own sake there's also they have their own job to do the great lakes as does the all of the ecosystem you know they they exist for their own reasons as well um, nature has its its uh its own rights um that we have to recognize so connecting to and protecting our local watersheds is absolutely critical um and it unites us more than it divides us and you know the Corporations are always uh, looking for uh, ways to get around what what little protections we do have. Um, you know, we work on international trade issues where the, these trade agreements are made. They're incredibly dry and boring. They've learned to make them as dry and boring as possible, right from the names on down. You don't get any um, any easy names anymore like they used to be. Um, and people fight back because they they recognize that that those international treaties that are you know signed at a, a a level where there's no input from the public from 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 us uh end up uh undercutting all of the protections that we have locally so if you want to protect your your local water supply and there's some international company that wants to come and build something there that is going to threaten it uh, you can't use your your local laws to to protect it anymore. The the international treaty trumps it, even though you had nothing to do with uh, consulting on that treaty, signing that treaty, or having any influence over the content of the treaty. But it decides that treaty is going to decide what happens in your backyard, literally. Um, you know, people, the whole idea of NIMBYs, you know, not in my backyard, they, they get a bad name, a uh, bad rap, but nobody is going to fight harder to protect the water than the people who live there, than the people who are the most connected to it and the most local to it. And it's just recognizing that all that water is connected and therefore all of us as people, all of our communities are connected as well. Um, the, the, some of the fights that we've had uh, against pipelines really illustrate that where this, you know, this metal pipeline is going thousands of kilometers perhaps across the country and it, it unites, the communities unite to fight it. Um, even though they're only worried uh, primarily, their concern is that one watershed that it's, that the that the pipeline is transiting. Um, that is their prime concern, but they're still supporting each other. It's quite a, a wonderful thing to see. And it, it really does raise hope that we have a, an opportunity when we can work together. Oh, there's so much of what you say. It's so lovely. I love this idea of, uh, I mean, I've, feel very strongly also about watersheds knowing which river you're connected to like I'm Thames nice to meet you you know <laughs> that, that that's us we all know this kind of trope of um cities you know of, of people of cities uh, rivers being the heart of the city and um uh, and this sense of the water being the heart of us but actually we need to make that our daily uh, act of knowledge you know that that we need to remake those connections every day to to feel that interconnectedness um, mm -hmm. and um uh it, it's so i mean i think that if you if you live with that sense of your watershed you live with the sense of of the geography of the land how it always goes flows gently down to the river at the bottom of the valley how you um but also then you it makes a nonsense of the boundaries that we build these, um, these, you know, these, these lines in the sand that people then push other people to die for. Um, and so in the defense of uh, a random choice, uh, a, a few, as you say, a, a, a bit of ink on a line on a, on a page uh, decided usually thousands of miles away from where you are. And, uh, and often with no, with no consideration for the physicality and the geography and the ecology, you know, there, the, the, just because you draw a line on a map doesn't mean that anything is divided in reality. Um, and, you know, there's all, all sorts of uh, fights happening around the world, the, the bad kind of fights where it's, uh, you know, uh, 
one community against another uh, because of the water use and and people upstream uh, uh, taking more water than the people downstream want them to take, et cetera, et cetera. And, and you know, water is, uh, it's a, there's a scarcity to water in so many parts of the world that, that it has always existed and it's only getting worse with climate change, with the, the massive droughts that come with that. Um, but even in Canada, where we consider ourselves to be water rich and relative to the rest of the world we are, but we still have localized water issues and, you know, localized meaning an area uh, of hundreds of square kilometers, perhaps, where um, droughts or contamination or uh, um, take uh, some entities taking too much water is, is becoming a problem. And it's, it's going to take a tremendous amount of resources to solve the problem, to bring water in from other places where, you know, the real answer is to solve the problem locally and, and treat the water correctly and, and, and not contaminate it and not overuse it. But, so that's, that's the fight that we're, that we're trying to organize and, and helping communities do that. Yeah, it's back to the commons and questions of sharing, you know, it's so we, it's, it's sort of, it goes, keeps coming back to that. Um, I, I wanted also, there was this lovely thing that you said about how, um, uh, there's an interesting thing about the names that, that people use that in these kind of, uh, treaties, they, the loss of the indigenous names. I was going back across, tr across maps of Ontario, trying to look for, uh, uh, trying to kind of decolonialize my mind to try to understand, you know, what to, to, to go back and further back to find the original names. And in the original names, you know, even in Toronto, Toronto, you know, there's all the knowledge of the, there's the knowledge of the landscape. It's, it, it, it claims kin with the trees and the water. So if Takaronto means where the, pl where the, the place where the trees meet the water, there's so many, or so many of the names, uh, of towns uh, and places nearby made that connection to a sense of self with the environment. Well, I mean, the, our, the original peoples here in North America, the, the First Nations or the Aboriginal uh, communities that lived here for tens of thousands of years, they, I think that they made that connection with the, the names connecting it to the actual places um, because they were so connected, uh, you know, that those waterways were their primary source of transportation. That's how they got from point A to point B, especially for long, long distances in, in this corner of the world, uh, the Great Lakes region, that it was absolutely a key way for them to get around. And so, uh, yeah, they would have been, they would have been making that connection all day, every day. And even if they didn't necessarily have the industrial uh, capability to destroy their water, um, they were so connected to it that it, it just, it wasn't going to happen. Um, and so we often were taking leadership uh, um, in the, the battles that we have uh, to, to uh, prevent the, de the destruction of, of water sources and, and pre um, prevent the contamination. We take our lead quite often and from First Nations um, that are either either First Nations activists that are in that community or they're uh, more organized uh, uh, bands and stuff. And it's, uh, it's a, a, a new way to work. It's, it's a bit humbling, to be honest, to, to recognize um, where they're coming from and the connection that they have. Um, and it also uh, grounds us so much. There's uh, my first experience with it um, was a, a fighting a dump site called uh, Dump Site 41, which was a 25-year battle um, before I even heard about it. Uh, the, the local community in near Midland, Ontario, um, had been fighting to stop this dump site from being installed, uh, built on a particularly uh, pure uh, local groundwater. Um, and, you know, the the community, the farming agricultural community and the cottagers there had been fighting to stop this dump site for 25 years and failing. And when they actually started to build the dump site, um, local First Nations uh, women came out um, and uh, they essentially said, this is not going to happen. Like, we're going to stop it physically. And 
that direct action. They led and inspired the community who had been fighting it for 25 years, but I guess they just didn't understand that they could do this, that they could actually block the roads and block the construction. And, you know, a bunch of people got arrested, but um, we won in the end. And the, you know, even though it was literally just a few weeks from the first bags of garbage hitting the bottom of that dump site, uh, we won. And it was this coming together between the First Nations, the the local cottagers and, and agricultural community, and uh, uh, groups like the Council of Canadians and the David Suzuki Foundation, other groups from outside uh, who sort of specialize in helping communities do this. And together, you know, we made this amazing um, story, I guess, of, of uh, the people being victorious when the people decide um, we're going to stop it. Because in the end, I think, and we, we've seen this over and over, when people say the water is so important to me, I'm willing to get a rest, I'm willing to take these risks. On the other side, the corporate side, you don't actually have people who are willing to risk their lives, risk everything they have uh, and their freedom uh, to destroy the water or to, to get their industrial project through. So they might have all the money <laughs> and you know all the full-time employees to battle it, but I you know, we have the people that care about the water that much more. And that is, you know, when it's organized correctly and, and when we have that critical mass and critical coming together of the different parties, uh, it's really unbeatable. So hopeful. You, um, it, it does, it gives me hope to hear you talk like that. It does feel occasionally like how can we, how will we possibly win when every uh, legal attempt to, to, uh, to safeguard the river by giving it, you know, we can't, uh, by giving it the uh, legal rights, you know, the personhood of rivers to, 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 to enshrine it in some way in a law that might safeguard it. Um, and I, I've always made me so cross over the years that you can't, uh, care for the water by giving it uh, river rights. You know, people, our law systems wouldn't possibly recognize river rights in that way. But if we anthropomorphize it and make it a, a human being a person, if we, we could give it personhood and then we might be able to care for, about it. It makes me so angry in itself. But even when we give it, uh, as over the last few years, a personhood of river uh, as a legal entity, it is so quickly... Uh, overturned by corporation law um, in, in the experience of the last few years as well, that it's, um, it is sometimes difficult to keep hope. But I love when you say that what we have is kinship, you know, this, this mm -hmm. sense of, you know, well, I'll fight for the rivers, you know, we'll fight. Yeah. And, <laughs> and when people are connected to the water, then they're willing to fight for it, right? That's at Site 41, the, the First Nations, I mean, their connection to the water, especially the, the, the women, um, that was uh, the Anishinaabe Kwe, that's the, how you say, um, the, the Anishinaabe women, their job, their, their role traditionally is to protect the water. Um, that's the women's role in that society. And so that like, it's, it's so ingrained in them and to hear them speak, wow, well, it's, it's very powerful. And, you know, now we have the, the, this global pandemic and, you know, water is that much more important, uh, especially for hygiene. I mean, the main way you can keep yourself protected is to wash your hands. We have First Nations across Canada where their reserves don't have clean drinking water. Uh, and in some places it's do not use, do not come into contact with the water. This is their, their tap water is so toxic that it, it gives them uh you know uh rashes and boils on their on their body if they can't even bathe in it so in places like that while there are improvements being made after many many years um there's slow improvements and there's still too many first nations that are that have uh they can't drink their their own water and that's um that's a, a an absolute shame and and something that we are continuing to push to try and uh and solve that that issue so the one of the ways that we try to to 
connect people to their waters through our blue communities project where uh, a blue community is a community it can be a, a municipality or a, a religious uh, community or a, a education community a university or college or a school um, it's where they they resolve uh, they pass certain resolutions um, that connect them to to the water and for a municipality for example it would be uh, recognizing the human right to water specifically that means that if people don't pay their water bill for whatever reason you can't cut them off um, which is I mean that's just good sense it's also um, you know we do have a human right to water and it, it and over a few dollars one way or the other it would be ridiculous uh, to cut people off their water and yet this has been the history in many places around the world in Detroit uh, people were cut off their water uh, for not paying their water bills and and it's not good for that society like you need people to have clean drinking water and clean water to for their hygiene otherwise <clears throat> everyone suffers so the right to water is very important um, keeping it as a, a public uh, the infrastructure keeping it public not privatized meaning that it's the government the municipal government is owning and controlling um, that water is absolutely critical when when p private industry gets involved there when they're the ones in control they they cut corners to boost their their profit and uh, you know before you know it um, the quality goes down and sometimes you have uh, you know literal contamination issues where people lose their lives and lastly is uh, to stop the, the the sale of bottled water in municipal facilities uh, you know at city hall in the arenas etc because bottled water like anywhere where there is drinkable tap water it's just it's ludicrous to be drinking bottled water and uh, not only is it ferociously expensive um, but commoditizing the water and making it something for sale when it is a commons when you've got access to clean tap water uh, it it's uh, the thin edge of the wedge to, to losing control over our water, absolutely. And there's the waste aspect. The uh, Nestle in the last few years has pumped enough and bottled enough water here in Ontario in their in their main bottling plant near Guelph. Uh, if you line the bottles up end to end, it would go to the moon and back. Just in the last, I think, four years now. So um, it's an astonishing amount of waste. Um, so we continue to to battle that. Yeah. And part of the um, a part of my work has been about um, trying to support the uh, remaking of new water fountains uh, on site, and and also trying to re understand the private public partnership that needs to happen there in order to fund this uh, you know the the gift of water uh, from the city to the to its inhabitants. Who are these cities for if not for us? You know, this is our this is our chance now to rebuild the cities the way that we need them to be to support human life and the more than human. Um, I, I think we do stand some chance of getting of uh, getting quite a lot of change at the moment too. I, I hope to. Um, well, the great change comes in moments of of great upheaval. So uh, sometimes the change is not good, but we're doing our best to to keep people focused on, on uh, changing things uh, for the better for, for all of us uh, and to try to reverse some of these trends that we've seen in the past, yeah. Yeah, and I love how your words so relate to, um, to the work that I do as well. This, the Museum of Water that I look after really tries to question where the authority lies for all the knowledge we are given. Who are we looking to for our influence and whose opinions are mattering more than ours? And I, I the museum that I uh, look after really tries to question that, that actually we've been, the histories we've been told are not correct. Um, so the question of kind of unlearning the knowledges we've been uh, pushed as a state lines, but also to to have um, to have proud to be proud in our own knowledges. That I think when you were talking when we were talking earlier of our 
our watersheds and the rivers that we stand up for and live beside. You know, I think that each one of us is a catchment area of knowledge. All the people we've met in our lives, all the books that we've read, all the thoughts that we've had, that all of this um, rises in each one of us to, to and it, it does us good to treasure that knowledge, to, to show that what I know matters. And so the museum that I look after just tries to listen really carefully to what everybody can tell me because it, they know. <laughs> yeah. It does the most amazing um, job of connecting people to their water and making people think about why is this water important? Why is this water worth putting in a museum and, and telling others about? And then like, I, I just flipped flip through your, your book showing some of the, uh, the other uh, um, entries in the museum or exhibits. I don't know what to call them exactly, but I mean, it, I was in tears. I don't mind saying more than once. Um, you come across these stories like people sending the, the bath water from their babies, their newborn baby's first bath. Like you make that connection and those people, I guarantee you, they will fight for that water to make sure that their baby has um, a, a good clean source of water. It's, uh, you know, it, it's really critical work that the Museum of Water um, uh, is doing. It, it's, I don't know if that's in, its intention, but it certainly um, does that, I think. And, and uh, so we're, we're really looking forward to, to, to taking part in, in the museum's uh, existence in Canada. Well, I'm, I, I, I'm so delighted to have been invited uh, to bring the artwork and and you know I, my role in it is really what I love is it's it is a question it's a process of careful listening that's all I do I but I I think that that as a process is also a uh, is also is part of what we learn while making the Museum of Water that that for each one of us our words matter and we for so long we've let um, other people tell us what was important. You know, museums are, somebody described them, Omar al Khattan described them as um, uh, sites of national patrimony. You know, that actually, you know, it's, this is a, this aims to be a whole different collection uh, of the here and now. It has, you know, three year olds snowballs as much as uh, grandmothers and grandfathers. It's all ages and races and genders and uh, it only, exists because other people bring things so uh it, it it i love that that it in itself is an action of interdependency and care absolutely okay. oh so nice to talk today um my pleasure uh, can't wait till we so this year we have this we begin with the virtual museum uh so i don't know what anybody will bring what would you bring <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm, I'm giving it some thought. I, I think I will bring my tap water, um, but I'll have to come up with a better way of expressing the importance um, to me of this water and why I'm connected to it. So you did just fine. That was so lovely to hear you talk. Thanks so much for Thank me you, talking together. All right. Bye. Great. Take care.